Um, yeah, we're starting. Good to go, Hashem. Can we start? Uh, yeah, should I start sharing the screen or? No, no, I'll, I'll start by introducing uh, Shadi and then Shadi will introduce you. Okay, sounds good. Bye. Um, welcome everybody to uh, the 11th uh, online uh, majlis. Um, we've had the tremendous uh, um, interest in this talk, especially, no surprise. It gives me great pleasure uh, to be hosting uh, our guest tonight, uh, Hashem al Ghaili, who is in Berlin. Uh, but Hashem will be introduced by uh, Shadi Qubati. Uh, I think this is a testament to how international this, uh, this thing is, uh, that we, we can be um, someone in Berlin and someone in uh, the UAE and someone in Cairo. <laughs> So Shadi will be introducing um, Hashem in a minute, but just a couple of things about Shadi. Shadi is a soon-to-be graduate of Yale uh, University. He studied uh, economics and political science. Uh, he also served as president of the Yale Arab Students Association uh, for a year or two, I can't remember. Um, but also, interestingly, in February 2019, uh, Shadi hosted our guest Hashem al ghaili at Pembroke College in Cambridge, where he was studying to a sellout audience. So I can't think of anyone uh, more uh, um, better fitting to introduce Hashem than our guest. Also happens to be uh, a smart Yemeni, but that's beside the point. Shadi, it's all yours. Firstly, I'd like to put on record our sincere thanks to you, dear Sultan, for continuing to raise the torch up high with this ever-expanding majlis during you know, very tumultuous times and for filling us with hope in times of despair. Hashem al-Ghali is a man who needs very little introduction. He's a Yemeni a science communicator known for his infographics and videos on scientific breakthroughs. As you mentioned, Sultan, we last met when um, and Sultan, I invited him to give a talk at Cambridge University in January 2019, where he spoke about three medical breakthroughs that would change the world. A year later, we now exactly know what one medical breakthrough we desperately need to change the world. Hashem runs the Science Nature page on Facebook, which has over 32 million followers from all around the world, and has garnered over 16 billion organic views. It's currently the most followed science page on Facebook and is among the fastest growing pages globally and generates the highest number of monthly views in the field of science and technology. Hashem has also recently produced a short sci-fi film, Simulation, which received a dozen of awards, including the best short film at the London Independent Film Awards. Nawarna Hashem, I'm a big fan of you. We're honored to have you again with us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for signing up. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I would like to talk today about my journey with science communication and also a little bit about COVID-19. And I think by going to the full screen, I can't uh, really see uh, the rest of you. So uh, we'll just keep it at the full screen. But I hope that everybody is hearing me uh, without any problems. Yes, we can hear you. Um, but do share your screen, though. All right. Now I'll share the screen. Uh, you have disabled it. <laughs> it needs I have to disabled be it. This happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see if it works now. All right. So it works. Now let's choose. All right. So that's good. Let's uh, go for the full screen. Do you see the full screen or is it blocked somehow? Oh, we, see, we see the full screen. All right, so um, I have been a science communicator for um, quite a while, actually. I started my science communication journey back when I was doing my bachelor studies. And it started with my Facebook profile, just like any profile. It wasn't even a Facebook page. Um, through this profile, I was really just focusing on uh, making infographics on a daily basis and also sharing links and exciting facts. And uh, at that point, Facebook introduced subscribers button so people can join, so they can get more updates from my site. Unfortunately, having a profile and sharing science is not the best on Facebook because profile do not allow you, uh, profiles do not allow you to see insights, which pages have. Now, insights basically is how many people have engaged with a certain content and how many people are coming back to watch a specific topic. And... When you look at these insights, they can help you in optimizing your content. 
And what I did after that is convert the profile into a Facebook page, which quickly became one of the world's largest pages among influencer creators, and um, especially for science content, generating billions of views every month. Now, um, the page is called Science Nature page, although it carries my name as well, but uh, I use that as a brand name. And uh, 2015 is basically when I converted the profile into a Facebook page, which now has over 32 million followers. Now, the topics that I focus on range between science, nature, medicine, and technology. And when we talk about science, we're talking about astronomy, uh, physics, astrophysics, biology, and uh, as well as chemistry. So these are the main topics that I cover on my Facebook page. Now, my role in all of this is I'm a science communicator, basically, which means I take complex information from authentic sources, in this case, scientific papers, which are published by researchers, and I simplify them and deliver them to the general public. Now, as a science communicator, I'm expect to maintain integrity and credibility. People trust me when I give them information. So it's important for me to make sure that the sources from where I get this information are credible as well. And they come from credible scientists as well who have done experimental work. Now, these scientific papers can carry really complex information. Sometimes, as scientists, you don't really want to read a full paper. So, uh, you can't really expect the general public to also be interested in reading a paper that has complex details. And that's where I step in to make it engaging and simplified. As a science communicator, I expect people who follow me to be open-minded to new ideas and also to be excited to learn new things. Sometimes we come across a piece of information that we don't like, but it still helps to learn about it because all forms of knowledge are useful and helpful. And so it's important to keep a certain degree of open-mindedness. And um, yeah, the question is, why am I doing this? I mean, I could just have a full-time job and just enjoy life <laughs> and you know, not uh, create video content and infographics on a daily basis. Well, I'm doing it for a number of reasons. First of all, I love doing it. Yeah, it's a passion. And when you are passionate about something, as they say, it's like you're not working anymore. And I mean, I spend sometimes sleepless nights really working on content because to me, it's fun and it's joy to the point where I also lift my PhD. So I started my PhD and three months later, I stopped and I decided that I want to just focus on science communication. Now, sometimes in life, we're faced with two options. Either we go with something easy or either we go with something that we're better at. Yeah, I could have uh, kept doing my PhD, but I'll be trapped in the lab for a long time. That's exciting too. I mean, you're learning. Or I could have become a science communicator in which there is more that I could offer to the society. So I decided that I want to be a science communicator because there is more that I can offer. Um, and another important reason is that, you know, with the globalization and the availability of internet and technology, the spread of information can really go fast, just like a wildfire or like a pandemic, as we are in a pandemic right now. So um, unfortunately, uh, most of the information that can spread um, might also come from unauthentic sources. And it's important to balance this out. As a science communicator, it's my responsibility that when I spread information that it comes from authentic sources, so that we balance out the false information that is available out there. And I think um, this pandemic proved to us how much we really needed science communication. I mean, you probably have come across so many conspiracy theories that have spread about 5G, Bill Gates, uh, a virus made in the lab and released by force, uh, pharmaceutical. I mean, I have also myself being called uh, <laughs> out for you know spreading information that comes from authentic sources because people 
disagree with these kinds of information. And let me tell you the problem with people these days, all right? When they go search for information, let's assume, for example, hydroxychloroquine, okay? There has been a lot of debate about hydroxychloroquine, whether it works or not. When someone goes on Google and they search for information, they search hydroxychloroquine does work, or they search hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. And they get the result they, they, they are looking for. They are searching with a predetermined mentality. And by doing that, they are filtering out other sides. They're not keeping their minds open. So when they see in their news feed that, oh, you know, I subscribed to this page a very long time ago, and now it's posting information about hydroxychloroquine that it doesn't work, oh no, they become defensive. So um, it remains important that we need science communication, especially at uh, such critical times. Now, the types of content that I publish have got articles, infographics, and videos. Unfortunately, articles can be really too long. They can be condensed, and not everybody has time to read. But they can be useful if you are looking for. Um, they can be useful if you are really looking for uh, details. Yeah. Now, the most engaging form of content right now is infographics and videos because they are visually engaging and they deliver abstract information within a very short time. Um, these are some of the infographics that I have made. There is one that was very popular. It's called This Week in Science, in which I highlight eight stories per week from the world of science. Then there are some daily facts that I, uh, I publish. Now, the thing here about these infographics is that when you see them in your news feed, they're not like articles because they have very beautiful colors and you stop by and you read. So we're basically here making science more engaging, more appealing while delivering the abstract piece of information. For example, if you see here about chronic pain, it summarizes the main findings of a research paper or a group of research papers. So if you are interested, I also share the sources and the links so that those who want additional details, they can also find these details. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic brought um, much need for science communicators, as I said. And that's why I released a series called Coronavirus News, which is basically daily updates on the coronavirus crisis, which cover, uh, you know, it covers for between six to eight stories every single day. And basically it takes me <laughs> two hours a day to edit this infographic. Um, and there has been great attention, uh, a great um, interest in this, um, in this infographic with many people really visiting the page over and over again to, you know, they refresh it to see what happened today with the COVID-19 pandemic. And sometimes I have noticed that if I shared it a little too early or a little too late, People are like, oh, it's late today, or it's too early today. I mean, they have even associated this with a fixed time. And I try to make sure that every day it's published on that particular time. Then there are these daily facts. For example, you see this daily fact about, this fact about uh, the link between strokes and uh, COVID-19. And it says that doctors are reporting strokes in young adults, yeah, which means it's an unexpected um, side effect of COVID-19 that you are finding strokes in young patients. But what you see here is the way this infographic has been designed, this daily fact. It's offering good information, but it's also very beautifully designed, very colorful, and it receives a lot of attention. So the presentation, I think as Steve Jobs said, it's not about, I mean, he said it's also about design and style, yeah? If only Apple kept that, by the way. Now, moving to uh, the videos. Um, I also produce uh, videos on a regular basis. There has been over, I think, 150 videos since the COVID-19 pandemic started. And as you can see, there is uh, also great interest in video content. They, they summarize basic information in short time. And um, yeah, you can see the thumbnails are also nice. They have been nicely designed. Now, um, up until I think 22 million followers, I was doing all of this by myself, but then now I have a team. So uh, four people 
who are also assisting in the writing and the production. And this helps accelerate making more content on a daily basis. And recently I started moving to uh, conducting interviews. There was a time in which I used to, uh, to basically have interviews and, um, with different scientists, but now I brought this back. Now the difference with these interviews is that they are pre-recorded. So I record them with the Zoom meeting with the scientist and we ask questions and then I edit them to make them look really nice, as you can see, like a TV channel produced them. Um, and when you really take care of the design, and make sure that you filter out all the information that is not needed, not that you're censoring. I mean, sometimes someone goes away from the main idea and they talk uh, about something else. So you, you just want to keep it concise and straight to the point. And that's why I do some editing. Actually, um, I was in the process of editing another interview, which will be uh, published tomorrow or after tomorrow, which is with uh, a professor from the University of California in Berkeley. Um, now 15 to 16 billion views so far in the videos on total and uh, it's exciting you know that there is a huge interest in scientific content there was a time when this form of content creation was limited to big production companies and channels like history channel and national geographic and uh, science channel but now everybody can basically create this content. And that, by the way, this, this, this makes it also dangerous as much as it's helpful because people can now spread ideas. And you know, it's important sometimes, as I said, to keep an open mind, but also filter the ideas that don't make sense. Uh, the tools that I use, you've got Adobe Premiere and After Effects as the main tools. But I have recently expanded to 3D animations that I make by myself. Um, I noticed that it's different when you use stock footage and when you create 3D animations that are original. First of all, the algorithm of the social media network, such as YouTube or, um, or Facebook, they favor original content, which is not being overused. Stock footage is used by everybody. But custom animation, it's only used by you. And this way, the video moves up and it gets more engagement. And that's why I started moving to Blender and 3ds Max to make my own animations. And I, I, I got this um, motivation after learning uh, basic visual effects from the movie that I made, Simulation, uh, which had really um, excellent visual effects from a company that, that is based in Berlin. Now, when you create a video, there are a number of elements that you need to take care of so that it remains engaging. First of all, you have to take care of the content quality. And if there is only one thing that COVID-19 pandemic proved is that quality content means something that people want to watch. Yeah. Um, it's important, you know, that you, you try to deliver to people something that they want to see as well. Um, and something that is engaging. Of course, it, it also has to be engaging to you, first of all. Um, but content quality is the first important aspect of any video. Then you have language simplicity. As I said, treat your audience as they haven't had any scientific background. Because not all of them studied science, or some of them have studied other fields. So um, while you are actually delivering information in simple, uh, in very simple way, you're also leaving the sources to more detailed analyses so that those who are interested in more or in depth details, they can click on these links. But remember, your target is general, everybody, not just scientists, so make the language as simple as possible. Then visual presentation, as I said, animations, exciting, um, exciting visuals, and also taking care of uh, the main story through visuals. If you remember in, uh, in the silent movie era, we would watch a movie and there is just uh, music. Yeah. In the silent movie era, we would still enjoy the film. Yeah. Uh, because it's a series of events that tell a story in the nobody's talking. It's very much like a comic book that doesn't have these speech bubbles and you can still understand the abstract idea. 
So visual presentation is really essential to make your video successful. And then you have the length. Um, people's attention lifespan can be really short. So one minute and a half to three minutes should be fine. Um, if you are really making a documentary with super excellent visuals and very high production value, then you can go for 45 minutes or one hour. I mean, if you have noticed the very old style of National Geographic and uh, History Channel, when people upload documentaries from the old time, they don't get a lot of engagement because it's a simple idea that has been stretched for 50 minutes. And that just doesn't really make any sense. The modern style of making documentaries is that you adjust the length. If it's a simple idea, make it short. If you want to tell more information, you make it long, but you take care of the production value. And I think there is a video that Sultan has uh, that he would like to share. It's one um, of the recent, yeah. Yes, I'll be showing the video maybe in 10 minutes, if that's OK. I have a bunch of questions I want to uh, send your way whenever, whenever you're done. Sounds good. Well, now we're moving a little bit from uh, the topic to talk about COVID-19, just quickly. So as you have seen, COVID-19 has been uh, one of the uh, terrible events that we have experienced in modern history. Now, the number of cases has surpassed 4 million, and the number of deaths is above 270,000. And some scientists believe that these might be uh, underestimates because the, uh, the infection could be more widespread and only antibody tests are going to reveal to us the extent, uh, the extent of the, in, uh, the infection. Now, the uh, coronavirus is now called the SARS-CoV-2 because it's not the first coronavirus that we encounter. There has been uh, other coronavirus, uh, uh, two actually. You've got the MERS, and then you have got the SARS, and both caused outbreaks uh, previously. Now, when you look at the virus itself, it's really just a simple structure. You have got a genetic material enclosed inside uh, basically a shell. The most important part also here is the spike protein because this spike protein is the protein that binds to the cell receptor. So when the virus reaches the lung, the lung cells there, they have a receptor called the ACE2 and the virus binds there. It leaves its genetic material inside, it hijacks the cells and basically it causes hyperinflammation. It forces the immune system to go overdrive so the immune system is overreacting to a condition that could be um, managed if, uh, if the immune system is under control. Unfortunately, when we talk about ACE2 receptor, it's present in different organs. You have lungs, intestines, kidneys, and also the heart, which means these other organs are also affected by this uh, virus. The most important thing that you, you need to know is how far are we with the fight against the coronavirus. Over 100 vaccines are currently in development and, and testing. And this is incredible because in just four months, researchers have already started working on vaccines. They received the information about the virus. The knowledge basically was built so fast that we have reached a very advanced stage of fighting the coronavirus with over 100 vaccines um five of them are already being tested on humans i could mention the one at oxford there is one at oxford there is one by moderna in the united states there is one in germany as well and there is one in china so um there are a number of vaccines that are already being tested and this is good because more vaccines being tested means faster at finding the vaccine that might work so if one doesn't work, maybe the other one will. Then in terms of treatments, you have got a number of different treatments. And the most important one is the antivirals. And these are existing drugs. The reason why you want to test existing drugs because it takes 14 years to develop a single drug. Yeah, 14 years from research to application. And so when you are testing existing drugs, you're trying to reduce 
the amount of time it takes to find something that is effective. And that's why, you know, when it comes to drugs, it's, um, you have to be picky because not all of them are going to work. Some of them might work on some patients. And the reason for this is that some patients have a medical history of other illnesses and they are taking other drugs as well. Mm -hmm. And when you give them a new drug, which interacts with the old one, because interaction, sometimes this interaction can lead to adverse problems. And that's why we need to uh, wait for the trials before we can determine if these drugs are effective. Now, the most promising drugs that everybody is keeping their eyes on, you've got remdesivir, which seems to be showing some positive results in the early trials. Then you have got Avigain. Avigain is a Japanese drug, which is meant for influenza, but it has already reached uh, phase three clinical trial. Phase three is basically the one before phase four. Uh, phase four, I mean, you need three phases generally, especially when we are in a pandemic. So if phase three trial proves to be successful, then this might be the one that we will be going for. Um, in the meantime, there are other drugs that are being tested. There is a very good website uh, created by the Milken Institute. If you, uh, it's, it's called COVID-19 Tracker, and it tracks how far we are in each one of these treatments in details, whether it's in clinical or preclinical studies. All in all, there are many countries that are going back to normal. I live here in Berlin, and I have seen Actually, I've been in self-quarantine for around uh, 15 to 20 weeks. Mm. Uh, it's fun, especially when you are introvert. Uh, well, uh, you know, when you leave, you, you see that, oh my gosh, what, what has been happening outside? Uh, it's like there is an apocalypse outside. But now life looks normal. In the middle of the pandemic, like, uh, one month and a half or two months ago, when you go outside, it's like completely empty. Say, if I want to create a movie in which there is nobody outside, this is my chance. <laughs> Except the police will come to you and say, hey, no gathering. But um, all in all, uh, countries started reopening slowly and gradually. And um, it's still a questionable decision. And from my latest interview with, uh, with Professor John uh, Schwarzberg, who is from the uh, University of California at Berkeley, he said that it's a premature decision, most likely, and uh, especially when it comes at a time when there isn't enough testing being done. It's really hard to tell. Only the upcoming few days are going to show us whether it's a premature decision or whether it was time for it. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Hashem. It's uh... I mean, I, I am overwhelmed with information, with knowledge, uh, and uh, I'm so grateful. Um, may I ask you to stop sharing uh, your screen and I will call on uh, the first uh, person I have uh, to, uh, to ask a question. We, we actually had a huge, a huge response, uh, but I've, uh, I have a question from uh, Fatma Al-Farah. Fatma Al-Farah actually uh, was a Georgetown uh, student, graduate, uh, she had she did an MA in Arab Studies and International Development, and she's also uh, Yemeni, I believe, Yemeni origin. Um, Fatima, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, first off, I have to say that Yemenis everywhere are inspired by your story, and hearing of your accomplishments brings joy to us all, especially during these troubling times. Um, and thank you for the content you're publishing. Your videos do in fact make a difference, um, especially during this pandemic. I am consistently sharing them. Um, I'm retweeting them, I'm reposting them everywhere to, and sharing them with friends and family. Thank you. So you've, you've kind of already hit on some of the questions I've asked um, or I was going to ask, but um, maybe you can uh, kind of embellish a bit more. So um, in this day and age, there is a race for information. You know, everybody wants to be the first. And with that, there are concerns with transparency and accuracy mm -hmm. in the field. Yeah. Um, my questions are, what are the challenges you face as a scientist and as a science communicator when choosing what to relate to the general public? Is there a moral dilemma? Um, is there a pitfall that pushes for releasing information that may, not, um, that may not be ideal or ready to release to a wider audience? 
Um, have you seen this play out with COVID-19, with the COVID-19 pandemic? If so, um, how? Yeah, well, I think I can relate this to the COVID-19 pandemic, especially when it comes to talking about treatment. Yeah. Let's say, I mean, there was a time in which I published a post about seven drugs that are currently being tested. It was a video about seven drugs that are currently being tested and they were still being tested. But I put a disclaimer saying, just because they're tested, don't go ahead and use them by yourself. I mean, these are existing on shelf. You can buy them if you want, but they can lead to adverse effects. So wait for clinical trials. It would be dangerous, you know, if we start making claims that would affect people's health, especially, especially when, uh, you know, they reach to a terminal stage in which, you know what, I will just do whatever it takes and take whatever out there. And um, yeah, now when it comes to publications, as you have seen, most of the papers that are being published these days are preprints, which means they haven't been, been uh, peer reviewed. Now peer review is a very important process in the scientific community in which a scientific publication must undergo through a process where different scientists will critique this paper. And it's back and forth until the information on this paper are valid and basically verified by all scientists. And then it goes for another period in which, uh, you know, you check if these results are reproducible and this is done by different other scientists. But all the information or most of that we, which we have right now is just preprints. They haven't been basic, but they can still contain useful pieces of information. The good thing about these preprints is that they are published in full. You can read the whole paper. You can look into the materials and methods and the way these things have been done. If that is sound and it checks in, you can publish that. If it's not, then you refrain from publishing it until um, it, it is peer reviewed. Um, thank you so much, uh, Hashim. Hashim, I have so many questions. I'll begin with uh, Riyadh Jukka, who is a, a Dubai-based architect. He asks, how do you monetize doing what you love given that you do not work with brands to advertise yeah. their products, which is great, he adds. That's, yeah, I mean, there has been a lot of interest from uh, brands to come in and put sponsorships, but I think, I think it doesn't work in the line of science because um, it's, it's a matter of credibility as well. If it's beauty and fashion, that's a different case. But with science, you need to maintain credibility and when people see sponsorships, they start questioning your credibility. But monetization is done with built-in platform um, monetization. For example, Facebook now has monetization, which almost everybody can sign up for if you are in certain countries, and Germany is one of them. Then you have got YouTube monetization. And um, depending on how you take care of the content and how you uh, deliver it, and how many views and how many shares, you can basically get good revenues from this monetization. And it really works well, I have to say. But uh, recently, the competition has increased. So um, it's, uh, it's becoming very difficult. Um, but it remains the main form of monetization. Then there are other ways of monetization. You could have sponsorship with non-brands. Yeah, not a pharmaceutical company that comes to you and say, oh, let's promote a drug. Say, no, that's, that's definitely not what I'm going to do. But non-brands like other media companies that have their own reach, their own audience, and they want to reach to new audience, that's also a form of monetization. You form partnership with them and you start creating content together. Then there is another form of monetization. For example, I publish my content in English. There are people who want to translate them into other languages and they want to monetize that. So that's also, it's, it's like a licensing deal. So there are always opportunities for monetization. That's really not a, a matter of concern. Um, before I play a segment of your video, there's a question from uh, Reem Khorshed, who is a uh, UAE-based ar architect and researcher. She goes, how do you deal with conflicting information from different authentic sources, especially during the pandemic example, whether to wear a mask or not? There yeah. are so many scientific views. Well, here's the thing. Um, there are websites now in which scientists share their thoughts about these preprints, for example. And these preprints can really have conflicting results. In, in some videos, I publish the two sides of view. Say some scientists believe this and some others believe that. 
yeah? And then I try to make sure that I focus more on the one that makes sense and the one that has more results that are authentic and valid, yeah? And in the end, sometimes you have to rely on people's ability to have common sense. Yeah, you can't really, yeah, you can't really go out there and force everybody to wear a mask if it's necessary or to take it off of someone's face if it's not necessary. People have to make informed decisions. You provided the information, it's not their decision to do or not. Um, Hashim, uh, would you allow me to play just a segment of one of your uh, videos? This video was nominated by uh, Shahdi Qubati to me. Uh, so it's a four minute video, but I will only be playing one minute uh, out of it and you can find it on uh, Hashim's uh, Facebook uh, page. Uh, can you guys see the video, Hashim? Yes. Okay, here we go. That just gives you a taste of uh, what uh, Hashim basically uh, does. And maybe a couple of questions that I would follow up from that video is one from uh, Dalia Bukhari. She goes, where do you gather your data from? And how do you maintain the reliability of the data? And Iman asks, how much research on average goes into creating a single infographic or even a video? Um, okay, so I have different sources. There are primary sources and secondary sources. Now, the primary sources are basically peer-reviewed journals, yeah? And you've got Nature Journal, Science Journal, um, and different other journals. And so then there are secondary sources, which can be universities that publish press releases. And then there are websites that aggregate these press releases and put them in one location. Uh, it's, it's we try to avoid basically the uh, sources that take from uh, from press releases because it's you know it's like a printing a paper when you print from another print from another print it becomes distorted towards the end yeah that's the information when it's from one source to another to another to another it becomes distorted and the facts um, you know need to be questioned and so the main sources are the authentic publications the research papers and then, as I say, the other uh, secondary sources like Eureka Alert, Fizz.org, Science Daily, these are really good sources of information and they publish mostly peer reviewed journals, uh, uh, peer reviewed articles. Um, there, there, a lot of research goes into, uh, into each infographic and video. For, for example, as I said, um, for an infographic like the one you said uh, you sh uh, you saw about the uh, strokes it would take two to three hours just for one infographic one piece you want to check the sources when there is a paper you want to check the institution where it came from whether there was a conflict of interest with someone else who funded the study um, you need to check these things the credibility of the authors and their previous work and this is also part of the research but there goes a lot of research before any infographic or video is being made. That's hours of research. Thank you so much, uh, Hashim. Uh, I have a question uh, from uh, Nafiz uh, Dakak, who is the chairman of IDRAK, which is a massive open online course platform. And uh, Nafiz is uh, based in, uh, in London. Uh, Nafiz, you're spotlighted. 
Uh, thank you, Sultan. Uh, thank you, Hashem, so much for all the amazing work you do. I think I'll be very quick. Given our agenda to promote, you know, high quality Arabic content, I was just wondering, you know, are you thinking of doing any of what you do now in Arabic? As you know, Yanni, we need as much uh, quality yeah. scientific content as possible. I would love your views on that. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I started uh, my channels in Arabic language and um, I had a team which was uh, supposed to take care of the Arabic division. But this became a little bit distracting from the English and I really wanted to focus on the English content. So I said, if there is anybody who will approach me, to translate the content into Arabic, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, it will be faster and easier. They will have their own team and they will take care of the content. And um, yeah, but um, uh, yeah, it, you know, when you, when you start something from scratch, especially with the Arabic, you need to form a lot of partnerships to promote the page and whatnot. And that can take a extra work, which can be spent on upgrading the content on the English page. But if you are creating Arabic content, well, you know, we can discuss that. Yeah. Uh, very well. So, of course, since uh, it's Middle Easterners who are speaking, uh, there's a question from Fedra Fatah who asks, can you discuss how our political systems distort the communication of science? For example, the way China, the US, Iran, and Germany have communicated the scientific risks have been very different. <laughs> uh, no, I always try to not be involved with political uh, questions, but surely there has been a lot of, uh, you know, politics involved in such event, politicizing the treatment with those who say it works, those who say it doesn't work, politicizing the strategy with those who say it's important to lock people at home and those who say, no, let's just let them. Um, I'm not sure about the Middle East, really. I haven't really tracked a lot what happened in the Middle East in terms of uh, how it was handled, except that some curfews were there in, uh, I think, Emirates and Egypt. But, uh, the, I mean, in the end, it depends on the numbers. Yeah, the numbers will tell. How countries handled it well will show, will be reflected. And people are appreciating what Germany did, what South Korea did, what Singapore did. And basically they don't appreciate the response from the US, for example, from Russia. Now Russia is becoming the epicenter of the pandemic. Every day, over 10,000 new cases. Um, so this can, cannot be judged by me, it can only judge by the numbers and a matter of time as well. Um, Hashim, I have so many uh, people who uh, are asking to, uh, to be given the mic. So I'm going to ask uh, first, uh, Mesa Jalboud. Uh, Mesa Jalboud is an educator. Uh, she was the uh, head of the Al-Ghurair Foundation uh, as well here. And she writes constantly about education. So she would like to ask you a question. Uh, Mesa, you're spotlighted. Go ahead. Oh, are you still muted? I'm so sorry. Unmute. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yeah, Great. Hi, Hashim. Thank you so much for the interesting conversation. As Sultan says, I worked with I, I'm a global in a global education, and I just wanted to know how much you work with schools, and perhaps if you can give us an idea in which parts of the world, uh, where do you get most traction? Hmm. Uh, most traction comes from the U.S. and Canada and also from South Asia, because now access to the internet has become easy and everybody has mobiles. And, and so South Asia has now become one of, of the top places from where the traction comes from. Now, as for schools, I have noticed that these videos are played in schools for children to learn from. And that was really exciting to see, but there hasn't been a school that came to me directly and said, let's produce some content together. But they come to me and they say, hey, we'd like to use your content to show it in a class or to show it in a conference or to show it in an event where people will attend. And um, yeah, that's, that's how it works. But they come to me and to ask for custom content, custom made, that hasn't happened. 
Uh, thank you, Hashem. Uh, Hashem, uh, we have a video from, uh, we have a question from uh, Munir Pavez, who was a senior uh, about to graduate uh, from uh, Georgetown University. He's studying global health, a pre-med student at Georgetown as well. From your experience, what is the best way to engage with others who have bought into conspiracy theories or are more skeptical about scientific evidence? Yeah. Well, there are, if you have seen recently, there was this documentary called Plandemic. Yeah. How many of you heard about it? Plandemic. Yeah, but I've seen, we've seen it all over. It's a lot of people talk all about. over the internet. Here's the thing. What that movie has, it's not even a movie, it's a video, basically. It's produced in a very nice style. And that person in the, in the documentary, basically, uh, disguises conspiracy theories as scientific facts. Someone who has a scientific misconduct and is delivering information that are really not authentic. But what really helped is the production style as well, the tactics that they have used. And that's a problem. So what you can use here is you push back. As I said, the way to deal with these kinds of information, first you push back, you debunk them, but most importantly, you pump out more authentic information from authentic sources to balance it out. Yeah? So people will be exposed to the two sides and then they can decide by themselves. And um, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable when I actually received that video from people who uh, I didn't think they would send that kind of content. So people are really buying into conspiracy theories in these critical times and that is dangerous. Um, Hashem, we didn't talk about your background. Uh, uh, you're, a, you're an Arab, a Yemeni mm. background. Uh, I believe you grew up, is it, in the Middle East, maybe in Yemen? In Yemen, uh, yes. What, in inspired Yemen. You, what inspired you, Hashem, to pursue this, uh, this career? I mean, when I was in Yemen, I used to share uh, basically information on uh, children's magazines. Majid, uh, yeah. Samir. And uh, a lot of Israel, if you remember all these ones. And uh, it was really exciting to see my name there with anecdotes with, uh, you know, some piece of information that I shared about science or some interesting thing. I was like, oh, no, people are going to learn about this from me. Um, but in 2008, I uh, finally found a fertile ground, which is social media, in which you can easily share information. And uh, combined with my background in science, because I did my master's in uh, molecular biotechnology and genetic engineering, I used my background in science and my background in video editing and uh, graphics. And I put them together and I decided that I want to use these two to communicate science. Uh, thank you. Um, I, we, we have so many questions here. Uh, I have a question from uh, Surya uh, that is very popular, Surya Shaheen, uh, who I'm trying to highlight, but I can't find her name here. There we go. She says, is there a site or a platform you recommend um, where info, articles, videos can be verified and, and false information can be debunked? Hmm. I think there is a website called uh, Scoop. Uh... There is a website that uh, does a fact check every day. Um, I think I can send you that and you can share it later with everybody. But uh, also now there is a, a partnership between social media platforms, especially Facebook, for example, with other companies like Associated Press and other fact checking universities and uh, organizations, research organizations. They fact check this information and when you post something on social media, it's flagged as false. Yeah. And then it links to the fact checked article so that you can see what's correct. But I will share the, the other website with you and then you can, uh, you can share it with everyone. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dana Abu uh, Bakr. Uh, Dana, uh, would you like to ask a question? Yes, hello everyone. Thank you, Sultan, and thank you, Hashem, for the interesting session. So my question goes to Hashem about a point he raised earlier about the research papers that are coming out in the current time being, especially regarding corona, have been released from labs without the sufficient 
time frame sure. for them to be repeated for reproducibility in other labs. So how does your page approach uh, sharing such, let's say, newer research findings? Yeah, as I said, you know, these papers are available in full. You can look into the methods and uh, if the methods are not valid or if the results are questionable, I just don't publish them. And in many cases, I really exchange them with other scientists so that we can discuss them, see if they are good to go, then I publish them. I mean, in the end, you don't really wanna shut your mind and you know ignore them completely. You wanna question them. And if there is some useful piece of information there and it's worth sharing, it will go, but it has to be discussed with other scientists. And that's why also I, uh, I started these recent uh, interviews because the interviews allow me to cover many papers at once and discuss them with scientists directly. Um, Hashim, I have a question from Emma Sky, who's the director of the Yale World uh, Fellows Program. Uh, Emma Sky, I, I, I suspect Emma means uh, COVID-19, but she asked, why do women seem to be less affected than men? With the COVID-19? I assume that's what she means, yes. I actually made a video on that, very detailed. Well, uh, first of all, the hormones, okay? So you have got the estrogen, and estrogen has been shown to offer immunity or a degree of protection for women, yeah? And then you have the chromosomes. You've got the XY chromosome in men, and then you have, uh, so basically when, when you have double chromosomes of the same type, you have an extra genetic copy of important genes. And these important genes are genes that offer a degree of immunity. They are essential as part of the immune system and women have more of these genes. Then you have lifestyle issues because men are not known to wash their hands very often. Yeah, I think that goes without saying. There was even a study that actually showed that. Yeah, it's a survey conducted. Yeah, how often do you wash your hands? And they don't. Also, as men, we don't really go quickly to the doctor when we have a medical condition. Yeah, we wait down, yeah, maybe it's going to resolve itself. And this makes it worse. And this puts us in... Uh, the group of people who have a pre-existing condition that would be worsened by COVID-19. So there are basically genetics, you've got genetics, you've got uh, hormones, and also lifestyle, um, lifestyle changes that need to be made by men if they want to protect themselves more. Um, Hashim, I have a lot of comments uh, actually in the chat. Um, many of them are praising your, your work, uh, which I will share with you. One of them is Faisal al fuhaid who is a uh, Kuwaiti, who says, this is my first time hearing a, your story as well as your content. I'm blown away. Uh, this is my first time also hearing the term science communicator. It goes to show that we need more communicators with other backgrounds, specifically law, politics, and business. I feel this would go a long way yeah. in helping people understand complex terms in a simpler fashion. Absolutely. I mean, especially with the economy, for example, and personal finances. Yeah, people want to manage their finances. And then, uh, um, I mean, there are different fields in which communicators are really needed. There are people who are good at communicating, but they just don't have the courage to go out there and to start. And then there is also a problem from universities. They don't offer uh, courses on communication and effective communication, which is really much needed on how to simplify information and deliver that to the general public through social media, especially that people are not watching TV much. You know, they just want to check their phones and get information from their phones. So uh, universities have a role to play here. Hopefully they open courses to teach people effective communication. And then depending on people's interest, we will have communicators in different fields. Um, I think I will bring back uh, Shadi uh, to have him ask a question, even though he did do the introduction. Uh, I feel like I robbed him from that opportunity. Uh, Shadi, uh, let me just find your video and then I will uh, highlight you. There you are. 
and I have to also unmute you, which apparently is a different thing altogether. Uh, there you go, Shadi. Okay, thank you, Sultan. Hashem, I wanted to ask you a question. A lot of people have been speaking about COVID-19 and how it's linked to temperature, and they've been using that to say that's the reason why it's not been spreading as fast in, say, India mm -hmm. or in various areas in Africa. To what extent is that true, or to what extent does that have to do with lack of testing? Thank you. Well, I mean, if you look in Australia, they had COVID-19, and it's really hot. Just before COVID-19, they even had wildfires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really too early to judge if uh, temperature is going to have a massive impact on the virus. Most of the studies that have been conducted so far are conducted in the lab. Yeah, And the problem with conducting a study in the lab is that it's a controlled environment. You control the temperature, you might miss some other factors, humidity, for example, and other things. Outside in the real world, there are so many things that play a role at once. If the virus is not killed, if, if it's, if the virus is not killed by the temperature, there might be something else that acts on it. Or a level of humidity must be on a certain level of temperature. So um, it's very hard to get results from real life in the outside world, and that's why summer is going to show us. If it works, that will be good. Then we will have enough time. It will buy us enough time to work on the treatment so that by the time winter comes and the virus gets back again, we are ready. Uh, we're coming to the last uh, three minutes. Uh, there's a question from Ewan Foster, and he says, how do you come to a decision on where to come down on the trade-off between accuracy uh, with detail uh, as, and simplicity? Oh, that's a very, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I mean, well, in the end, you have to understand that there is always a way to simplify any complex information. Okay, and that's why sometimes I use analogies, comparing things together with something else to make it more understandable. But um, if it is between simplicity and accuracy. I would line up more towards accuracy. Yeah. And um, if, if, if the information can be, I mean, sometimes if you oversimplify a thing, you can misrepresent it. Yeah. And I don't really want to do that. So I would rather avoid saying it than actually say it mm -hmm. and make it look or sound wrong. Um, Hashim, I think I'll, I'll ask uh, the, the final question for tonight. Uh, and this is a question that I don't suspect you have an answer to, but I just have to ask. Uh, based, based on all the science you've come across, how optimistic uh, or pessimistic are you uh, for us human beings in general, and also for, for us to find a cure for COVID, let's say in 2020? Well, well, how optimistic for the human race in general? I mean, with what COVID-19 showed, with all the incredible massive amount of division between people, everyone trying to push something, it's really dangerous. And it shows that if we were struck with a problem that's worse than this, and I don't know what could be worse than this, we probably won't be able to handle it well, honestly. Um, so, but we remain hopeful that things will change because we're not the only generation that will stay here. There'll be other future generations. They might be better than us, as Carl Sagan said. Um, but finding a treatment for COVID in 2020, I think, I think there is some progress. It would not be a vaccine though, most likely. It would be one of the existing drugs that are being tested. It could be remdesivir, it could be Avigan. The problem is, even if we found it, as many scientists have told me, we still have the logistics. They say it might take more for the logistics than it takes for research to find the treatment itself. Manufacturing, distribution, making sure that it reaches to everybody and also the costs. So if we find the treatment early, let's hope that the logistics will also be taken care of early as well. Um, Hashem al uh, first of all, I'm immensely thankful to you for your time. Uh, we are very, very proud of you. I feel like I speak on behalf of everybody, uh, the things that you are doing, the way that you are making science accessible to us all, 
people who uh, really don't understand what's going on and are overwhelmed with all this uh, data and information. I think you're making it so uh, much easier for us to process this. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the comments on the chat uh, from Rumuz uh, Ibi says, uh, listening to this is mega therapeutic. So uh, you do have Thanks. a Thank you. Have, you do have a voice, I think, that is very soothing as well. So thank you so much, uh, Hashem al -Ghairi. Thank you so much, uh, Shadi Qubati. Thank you all for joining us, and I'll see you uh, hopefully next Wednesday. All the best. Thank you so much. Take care. Shukran, ya Hashem. Shukran, Jazeelan. Shukran. 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 I will send you the video as well now. Sounds, sounds good. Awesome. Masala. Awesome.